All right, everyone, we are ready to get started. Hello, everyone. On behalf of AgriLinks, Feed the Future, and the USAID Bureau for Food Security, I would like to welcome you to our webinar today on overcoming gender barriers to accessing and using climate information services. We're going to have a great discussion today about gender-related differences in climate information needs, access, and use and the downstream effects of these differences on climate adaptation responses and longer-term resilience. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management and Learning Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I will be your webinar facilitator today, so you'll hear my voice periodically, especially during our question and answer sessions. Before we dive into the content, though, I would like to go over just a few items to quickly orient you to the webinar. First, please do use the chat box to introduce yourself and let us know where you're joining from. And I can see that many of you have done that already, so thank you very much. The chat box is your main way to communicate today, so we encourage you to use it to post questions at any time, to share resources, and to discuss the topic with your colleagues. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll answer some of them in the chat box along the way, and we'll hold others until after the presentation. You'll see that the slide deck is right now available for download in the box on the left of your screen that says File Downloads, uh, if you'd like to grab a copy of them right now. But they will also be posted on the AgriLinks event page uh, a little bit later. And lastly, we are recording this webinar, and we'll email you the recording, the transcript, and any additional resources that are suggested uh, throughout the webinar once they are ready. So keep that in uh, your eye out for that in your inbox. Okay, well I am going to go ahead and introduce our speakers and then we can get started with the webinar. First up will be Krista Jacobs, who is the Senior Gender Advisor in the USA Bureau for Food Security. And she will provide an introduction to the topic and its importance to global food security. Next up will be Elizabeth Bryan, who is a Senior Research Analyst in the Environment and Production Technology Division at the International Food Policy Research Institute. And her current work focuses on trade-offs and synergies across the intersection of climate-smart agricultural production, nutrition, gender, and environment. Then we will welcome Tatiana uh, Gumuccio, a postdoctoral research scientist at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society at Columbia University. Tatiana is involved in investigation of the causes of gender differentials in access to and use of climate-related information and the factors and conditions that can contribute to gender transformative climate information services. And then lastly, we will have Kristen Lambert, Mercy Corps' Program Manager for Climate Change and Resilience Research on their, resilience, or on their research and learning team. And in this role, she provides technical and programmatic support to grants focused on climate information services and resilience learning. So we've got a really great lineup of speakers to discuss this topic today. And first off, I will pass the microphone over to Krista Jacobs. Hi, thanks, Julie. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. As Julie said, I'm the Senior Advisor, Senior Gender Advisor in the Bureau for Food Security in USAID. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to our speakers, Elizabeth, Tatiana, and Kristen. We often use the term climate smart agriculture, and we talk about how climate smart agriculture is essential for agricultural systems to be productive, sustainable, less risky, and more resilient. But today I want to reframe and think about climate smart farmers. These are the people who we want to be able to proactively manage both natural resources and risk. These are the people whose resources and decisions shape their productivity, both in the short term and long term, as they are experiencing climate-related shocks and changes. To be a climate-smart farmer, the person needs to have information and also be able to apply that information. With the global food security strategy and the new research strategy that accompanies it, we're increasingly turning our attention to the question of what are the things that need to happen for all of these good agricultural practices and technologies to be widely used so that we can have food security impact at the individual, household, community, national, and global levels. So how do we get that information out there and used, and is it the right information? At the same time, we also need to remember that women are a substantial part of these farmers who we want to support to be climate smart. In sub-Saharan Africa, only for crops, not thinking about livestock, Depending on the country, women may be supplying as much as a quarter to a half of the labor. 
if they don't have the demand for climate smart, for climate information, like forecast, pest disease management, and pest warnings, or they don't know that that information is available or how to get it, or if they're not able to use it, they're less able to manage that risk and to have good production and good income. So today, our speakers are going to talk about their work, about how women and men farmers perceive changes in climate, <coughs> where they get information about how to manage the effects of those, you know, of the variability, of the risks, and how women and men are able to apply that information. So I look forward to the discussion, and now I'll turn the microphone over to Elizabeth. Great. Thanks, Krista. Hello, everybody online. Thanks for joining us. Um, my role here today is to try and frame this issue of gender and climate information in the sort of broader context of gender and climate change. And so I'm going to start by giving some motivation for why it's important to think about gender and also nutrition issues in relation to climate change. <clears throat> and then I'm going to give an overview of a framework that we developed at IFPRI that highlights the linkages between gender, climate change, and nutrition. And then um, I'm going to emphasize um, gender and climate change linkages in this pre uh, presentation, but it's important to also highlight that climate change and climate change responses have implications for nutrition, and gender issues also intersect with the pathways from agricultural production uh, to nutrition outcomes. And uh, finally, I'm going to zero in on where climate information fits into the overall framework and present some data on gender differences in access to climate information and knowledge and adoption of climate smart practices. Can I change the slide? One. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay. So gender and nutrition are two key areas worth paying extra attention to in climate change programs and interventions. And why is that? Well, one reason is that it's important for the sake of equity. Programs should ensure that both men and women are benefiting and that there are no unintended harmful impacts being felt by any particular group of people. Um, in addition, research suggests that paying attention to the gender and nutrition implications of policies and programs may increase their effectiveness. In the case of Climate Smart Agriculture, or CSA, um, paying attention to gender and nutrition also has the potential to achieve other development outcomes, such as improved nutrition and health or women's empowerment, in addition to maximizing gains across the three pillars of CSA, which many of you know are productivity, adaptation, and mitigation. So because integrating all these cross-cutting themes like resilience, climate smart agriculture, gender, and nutrition can be quite complex, um, at IFRI we developed a framework to facilitate decision making around these issues uh, by illustrating the linkages between resilience to climate change, gender, and nutrition. And this framework draws on a review of the literature on gender and climate change, on the literature on agriculture to nutrition pathways, uh, climate change and nutrition, and resilience literature. And this review found that most studies often integrate two or three of, or one or two of these topics, but usually not all three. Um, and so this framework identifies and integrates the key elements from all these different bodies of literature in one place. So starting on the left-hand side, the first element in the framework is the climate signal. And this includes things like climate variability, climate shocks like droughts and floods, as well as long-term climate stressors. <clears throat> and the impacts of climate shocks and stressors are filtered through uh, several elements in this framework. And these include absorptive and adaptive capacity in the green box. So adapted from the resilience literature, we define absorptive capacity as the sensitivity of people at various scales to shocks and stressors given their current livelihood activities, infrastructure, resources, and other factors. Adaptive capacity is the ability to respond to shocks and stressors. And as you can see in the gray box in the middle, these responses can be categorized in terms of coping responses, risk management responses, adaptive responses, and transformative responses. And the funnel in between these two elements, that yellow uh, funnel there, um, indicates that absorptive and adaptive capacity determine the range of response options that decision makers have. So that low absorptive and adaptive capacity means that people may have more limited response choices available to them. Another key factor that determines 
people's responses to climate shocks and stressors is the decision-making context. So people have different preferences, different needs and priorities, and their ability to meet those needs depends on their bargaining power and control, and particularly when the interests of different actors are not aligned, this is important. At the bottom of the gray box, we have highlighted several different pathways through which response choices can influence development outcomes, and these include things like food production, income changes, asset dynamics, labor allocation. And these changes affect the broader food, social, health, and living environments in the outcomes box, and also key um, outcome indicators such as food and nutritional security, gender equality, health status, and environmental security. It's important to point out that there are trade-offs across these outcomes and across different groups of people. So for example, new climate smart approaches may increase the labor burden of one group of people more than another. And responses to shocks and stressors affect greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which can contribute to future cl climate change, which is shown by the arrow on the top. And similarly, outcomes that are experienced today can affect absorptive and adaptive capacity uh, to respond to future shocks and stressors, as indicated by the arrow on the bottom. So this whole framework is really dynamic and illustrates this concept of resilience being a sort of a changing set of capacities over time as people respond to the shocks and stressors that they're experiencing. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, where is gender in this framework? Uh, gender can be found pretty much in almost all of the elements of this framework. Um, there are differences between men and women in terms of their ability to absorb and adapt to shocks and stresses. So that's the circle over the absorptive and adaptive capacity box. Um, there are also uh, men and women have different preferences and needs for how they respond to shocks and stressors. Um, although women tend to have less bargaining power and control over decisions at home in their communities, and women also tend to be less represented in policy decision-making circles. And the impact of climate shocks and stressors and the responses to them can also affect men and women differently leading to an increase in gender equity or greater gender inequalities. And finally, the differences between outcomes for men and women today can then lead to different capacities to respond to future shocks and stressors. Okay, <clears throat> so there are many barriers to adoption of practices for climate smart agriculture. And these factors determining adaptive capacity are different in every context. Some factors may be more of a constraint in some settings than in others. Um, in general, we find that women tend to face greater barriers to responding to climate shocks and stressors. And these kinds of barriers are listed here in terms of uh, women tend to have less access to and control over assets. They may have different perceptions of climate change. And I'll talk a little bit more about how women tend to be less likely to perceive climate change. They also have different um, access to labor. Um, they have more difficulty in many cases participating meaningfully in groups, or they may be prohibited uh, from adopting certain practices that are considered not appropriate for them. So social norms and institutions are also important. Um, and they have limited decision-making authority, as I mentioned, at home um, and in the community. Access to information about climate change and having access to information about the appropriate responses is one of the key determinants of adaptation that has been found across many studies. Um, because by definition, climate smart agriculture isn't climate smart unless it's informed by climate science. So information is really critical. And what we find is that uh, data from multiple different case studies around the world tend to show that women are often at a disadvantage with respect to access to information. Um, given that men and women have different preferences for adaptation responses, they need access to information that meets their particular needs. The responses that are chosen have different implications for men and women, um, importantly. So if women don't have access to information and are able to adopt practices that meet their needs, then we may see an increase in the gender gap in agriculture. <clears throat> Sorry, went the wrong way here. Okay, so what do the data show? Um, to illustrate the importance of the gender gap and access to climate information, I'm going to present some results from an intra-household survey that was carried out in selected sites in Kenya, Senegal, and Uganda under the CGR program for climate change, agriculture, and food security. 
And this survey asked men and women in the same household the same set of questions related to things like perceptions of climate change, adaptation responses, access to information, um, experience of, with shocks and, and other factors and other um, issues. And we know that people tend to adopt practices based on how they perceive the climate to be changing and the way they uh, perceive these things over their, their own experience. Climate information can help influence people's perceptions of climate risks, especially about which climate changes they can expect in the future and the range of uh, response options to address these future challenges. And here in these images, I present men's and women's perceptions of the climate changes they've observed over their lifetime. Uh, the data show that in general, across all the sites, women tend to be less likely to perceive climate change. And the case of Senegal on the left here really illustrates that. Um, women are less likely to, per to perceive all of the climate changes that are listed in this figure. However, in the case of Uganda, we found that sometimes men, you know, men and women are equally likely to perceive that there has been climate change, but they actually report different changes. So here, women are more likely to perceive an increase in droughts and temperature, while men were more likely to report that they had experienced rainfall changes. And so um, moving on to looking at information, um, this table shows the level of access uh, to different sources of information for men and women across the four sites. And the teal color, or it's a dark blue color on this screen, um, shows that men are more likely to have access to um, the information source, and the green color shows where women are more likely to have access to the information source. So rather than running through all the different sources of information, in particular, I'm just look at the broad trends. And in general, we see that women tend to have less access to most sources of information, including many formal sources of information like extension agents or NGOs. Um, there are also differences across countries that are important to point out. Women in Kenya seem to have somewhat better access to information compared to the other two sites. Um, and, but in general, in some sites like Kefrin in Senegal, we see very low access to information for both men and women. And what this translates into is that given less access to information, we find that women tend to be less aware of a range of climate smart agriculture practices. So the practices are listed on the left. And again, the dark blue indicates where men are more likely to be aware of the practice. And the green shows where women are more likely to be aware of the practice. Um, so we find somewhat greater awareness of several practices among women in the sites in Kenya where, as we showed in the last table, women tend to have somewhat better access to some sources of information. And in this table, um, well, before I get to the table, in general, the data show that adoption rates of many climate smart practices are low among women, especially compared to men. Um, this table shows actually adoption rates among men and women across the four sites um, when men and women are actually aware of the climate smart practice. So this is conditional on awareness of the practice. And as you can see, there's a lot more green in this table. And this means that when women are aware, they are in many cases more likely than men to adopt these CSA practices. And often we find this pattern of adoption relates to women's gender roles in these contexts. So women are more likely to adopt practices such as water harvesting, improved grain storage, and improved livestock feed management. And just to wrap up um, and move into the more specific uh, presentations about gender and climate information, um, the intra-household data show that there are differences in the ways that men and women perceive climate change and respond to climate change. And while there are many constraints, um, as I highlighted, to responding to climate change, and all of these have important gender differences, Access to climate information is often a barrier that we find across many, many different contexts, uh, especially for women. And so what this means is that more work is needed to ensure that information reaches women and that this information meets their specific needs um, and preferences for adaptation. 
And I think we're going to hear more in the presentation later about some approaches to really be able to do that more effectively. Uh, so addressing these gender gaps in access to climate information potentially has really large payoffs by increasing uptake of appropriate response options and by enabling women to in contribute to greater household and community resilience to shocks and change. And now I will turn it over to Tatiana, who is joining us from online. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. Um, and uh, hello, and thanks to all of you for this opportunity to participate in the webinar with all of you. Um, this is a really great and um, important topic to be um, addressing. Um, as mentioned, uh, I'll be presenting on a review that we've been carrying out at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society uh, with the CGIR research program on climate change, agriculture, and food security on uh, what's the knowledge base with respect to gender and climate services. Um, in particular, through this review, we've been really seeking to assess the evidence about gender differences in access, use, and benefits from climate services for farmers in the developing world, and then from this uh, uh, nuanced understanding uh, of the knowledge base to be able to start identifying some potential pathways for making climate services more responsive to gender inequality. Um, so just to uh, briefly uh, uh, present some of the topics that we'll be going over, um, first off I'll be uh, introducing a bit of what publications were included in the review uh, and then going into a deeper discussion of what, we, what we're learning so far from the existing literature on gendered access to climate services. And here I just want to explain that with access, we're uh, thinking of access as um, uh, addressing various aspects, one of them being accessibility of communication channels, and then another that has to do with uh, demand, which we're we'll getting into a little bit later. And then um, from here, we'll be going into a a deeper look at what we can learn from the literature with respect to gendered use of climate services. And here, again, just to explain a bit more, when we're thinking about use, we're thinking about how women and men are being able to act on or use climate information to make changes in farming or livelihood management. And then um, we'll be presenting uh, some brief conclusions that we're developing so far from the review. So. Um, so we've been including publications from peer-reviewed journals. However, we've also been including uh, reports and working papers that are related to these uh, main issues of how gender is influencing access to use of and benefits from climate services. Um, now, from this, we've identified so far a total of 39 publications that are relevant to these issues. And you can see here that um, most of them are addressing the Sub-Saharan African region. And there in the figure, you can see um, the breakdown of the countries that are represented in that uh, uh, group of literature on the Sub-Saharan African region and uh, how many publications are addressing each country. Um, and just the, an aside, uh, of course, several publications are multi-country. Uh, then to look at the extent to which the topics of interest are being addressed um, in this body of literature, we see that access is addressed quite frequently, and then secondarily, use. And really, there's a very minimal amount of the literature that's addressing benefits at this time. Um, so um, for that reason, in this presentation now, um, we're focusing on the main topics of access and use. So to get kind of the mental juices flowing um, with respect to this topic of uh, how gender is influencing access to climate services. Uh, here, this table is summarizing some of the information from a few of the publications um, on, uh, on how, well, the extent to which women and men are receiving different types of weather and climate information. And um, just to highlight that uh, the first four studies uh, have to do with baselines, and really all of the studies, all five, are referring to climate information that's routinely available and not studies carried out in the context of well-designed climate service interventions. And something to highlight is that, um, as you can see, it can be difficult to identify one major trend um, that say that men are accessing more than women or women are accessing more than men. 
Um, in many cases, in fact, you see that uh, uh, men and women seem to be accessing at similar rates. And, and here, um, the, the green is signifying men accessing uh, more than women, to, uh, and the difference is significant. Orange, uh, vice versa, that women are accessing the information, and the difference is significant. Um, it, however, it is interesting. Um, you see, um, with regards to information on drought early warning, um, there's uh, at, at times a, a consistent uh, observation that men are accessing the information uh, more than women. Um, but again, really, um, a, a main point to be highlighting from this table is just um, that really there are underlying factors that are site specific that, that need to be understood with regards to gender, with regards to when there are differences or convergences, uh, for example. Um, so now it could be said that in the existing literature there might be uh, a lack of research that goes a step further than documenting to what extent women and men are accessing climate services. Um, uh, it would be helpful to have more research that gets into analysis of the factors or reasons why for these gender differences or their convergences. Uh, however, from the literature that does get into uh, analyzing the possible factors, um, uh, we see that it tends to focus on the importance of accessibility of communication channels, which is, um, uh, I think there's overlap with um, some information that Elizabeth was just presenting as well, the, imp uh, the importance of uh, what are the sources of information, um, et cetera. Um, so in particular, uh, with regards to uh, literature analyzing uh, importance of accessibility of communication channels, we see a couple important gender issues emerging uh, most prominently. Um, first off, the importance of how sociocultural norms surrounding women's and men's uh, appropriate activities, responsibilities, uh, spaces that they frequent, how this can be influencing uh, differential access to extension services and points of dissemination information, uh, information uh, dissemination of information. And then also how these sociocultural norms can be differentially influencing women's and men's time and mobility constraints. Um, another issue that, that arises is uh, the importance of access to group processes. Uh, for example, that because of male biases and membership of farmers groups, for example, women may encounter significant barriers and challenges to participate uh, in these groups and access important information. However, uh, from the studies, you're also seeing that uh, while well, the utility of women-specific self-help groups um, for uh, getting information out to women in a meaningful and helpful way. Um, another issue that uh, emerges is the importance of this differential access to information and communication technologies, as well as radio, uh, due to uh, financial challenges, also due to differences in uh, technical knowledge, uh, among other factors, uh, women can find themselves, uh, well, much less than men, uh, in control of ICTs and therefore um, uh, 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 facing certain challenges to access certain types of information. Um, so you see, um, from the knowledge base thus far, um, there's not so much research on this demand aspect of access, but, but, but a good bit of focus on the accessibility of communication channels. Now, getting into the issue of use, again, kind of to start getting us thinking about how gender can influence uh, acting on climate information uh, received. Um, here is a table summarizing some of the information from a few of the publications uh, on uh, the extent to which women and men are acting on climate information in their agricultural and livelihood decision making. And, uh, and just, again, to highlight that the first two studies, um, those are baseline. And then the last two, actually, um, for example, the one by party in, in Ghana, uh, was carried out in the context of a mobile advisory program. And then the very last one, um, uh, research in Rwanda, is referring to a monitoring and evaluation study of, of PICSA, the Participatory Integrated Climate Services for Agriculture Intervention. And again, really um, uh, something to highlight here is um, that, again, it's 
um, difficult to identify a, a major trend of, say, men putting into use information more than women or vice versa. Um, and it's really important to think about the underlying factors that could be influencing um, the differences or convergences. Um, so again, um, we see uh, perhaps a, a, a lack of research uh, that analyzes, that goes a step further to analyze what could be the reasons, what could be the, the factors influencing um, gender differences or, or, or convergences. Um, however, from that literature that does get into this, we see an emphasis on this important dynamic of how sociocultural norms can influence men's and women's differential resource control and therefore their capacities to uh, put to use climate information learned uh, in their changes in agricultural management. Um, similarly, you can see how sociocultural norms regarding division of labor can influence then the types of decisions that are under women's or men's control and therefore that can influence the type of climate information that will be uh, more relevant to women or men. And just to give an example to illustrate this a bit more, um, we see from a study in Senegal that due to the expectation that women labor on men's plots before they do on their own, uh, uh, women aren't able to access labor and farming equipment uh, until afterwards, and that uh, this influences that women tend to have a preference for climate information on rain cessation as opposed to rain onset, uh, for example. So just to start to sum up some of the findings um, that, that are coming from this review that we've been doing, uh, we see how uh, several important gender issues emerging and, and how they're affecting uh, access to and use of climate services. Um, for example, the difference in access to group processes and how this can differentially then affect women's and men's access to technical information and training um, through participation in farmers groups, for example. However, an important potential solution that's um, being uh, highlighted in some of the literature is, is the importance of interventions, including uh, women's groups and networks as a means to uh, get uh, climate information to women in a, in, a, in a really helpful way. Then uh, there's the issue of differential access to ICT and how this can affect uh, women's and men's differing access to routine weather information and advisories. And then also how social norms that influence time and mobility constraints and also access to public information services like uh, through extra local public meetings, how uh, this can also influence uh, women's and men's different accents, access to mainstream information sources. Um, however, uh, kind of a way forward that's emerging or, or that's getting highlighted um, in some of the studies we've seen is, is really emphasizing the importance of, of research that gets that, identifying those channels that do serve women and using them. Uh, oftentimes participatory methodologies, certain types of participatory methodologies can be most helpful for this. And then getting at the issues that are, are important for, for access, uh, again, we're seeing uh, how social norms and resource control can influence the decisions under men's and women's control, and then how this can affect the type of information that will be most relevant to women and men. Um, from this, we're understanding that uh, it will be critical for interventions to, uh, to uh, first have gain a, a strong understanding of women's climate information needs and then uh, develop the means to meet them. And then uh, finally, uh, we're identifying from the literature that really limited resource control, for example, a lack of land control, can influence women's capacity to put into use climate information. And, um, really a, a way forward for this that will be important is collaboration across sectors in order to address these challenges that can go beyond climate services. Um, so um, with that, um, I'm summing it up and um, uh, look forward to the discussion later on. And thank you again for, um, for, uh, for, uh, for coordinating and facilitating this webinar. And I'll pass it on to um, Kristen. Tatiana and
thank you everyone for joining us. It's, it's great to see so much interest in this topic. Um, and it's been really wonderful to hear the research that you, Elizabeth, and Tatiana have been sharing and the complementary between your findings and, and what I'm just going to talk about here. Um, so my name is Kristen Lambert. I work with Mercy Corps on the research and learning team with a focus on climate change and resilience. And I'm going to be sharing some insights in particular from the USAID-funded Climate Information Services Research Initiative. Um, and I see many of our colleagues are joining today from uh, Sierra Practical Action and others in our country offices, so it's great to see that. Uh, before diving right into our research, though, I wanted to start off with just a small story that we heard from one woman farmer that we recently spoke to in Niger when asking her to tell us a bit about how things had changed in her community over the last 10 years. And what she told us was, before we were just two people working the land and we produced a lot. Now we can be 10 people and there's less produced. Our families are bigger, the community is bigger, but the land is not good. We face so many problems, violent wind, drought, the season is so short now, it is very easy to lose very much. And this is just one farmer sharing an experience from one village, but I think it's really emblematic of the changes and challenges that rain-fed farmers are experiencing at a larger scale. So if we zoom out from that school story to the country level, we're talking about over 80% of Niger's labor force dependent on rain-fed agriculture, which makes up a, about a quarter of the GDP. And women farmers are contributing at least 25% of that labor force. And if we zoom out again, uh, looking across sub-Saharan Africa, we know that rain-fed agriculture accounts for almost all the farmland in that area, making a really large contribution to GDP. And approximately half of the labor force on average is women farmers. And yet we also all know that in this area, as we heard from that first story, um, there are multiple risks. Climate variability has brought increasing challenges from dry spells, floods, and late onset rain, especially in places that are already facing increased land infertility, market instability, and growing populations. And we also know that when times are hard, research shows us that it's women who are typically more likely than men to be negatively affected. And yet research also shows us that women are, when women are empowered with the resources and the information to take action, they can be powerful agents of resilience for their households and communities. So it's in this context that climate information can serve as one critical piece of a bundle of tools and resources necessary to support men and women to take actions that can increase resilience, enhance production, and improve food security. So for this reason, we've seen investments in climate information have been increasing in recent decades. But designing and implementing effective CIS systems that respond to users' needs is challenging. That's something we just heard in the last two presentations. And as a result, existing CIS programs often fail to achieve their full potential impact. And that's really the challenge that's been posed to the project that our team has been working on, the USAID-funded Climate Information Services Research Initiative, or CISRI. Donors are increasingly investing in CIS, but we're still not sure what works for effectively meeting the diverse needs of farmers in ways that lead to increased food security and resilience. The CISRI consortium that you see here is led by Mercy Corps, and it's made up of the partners listed on this slide. We're a mix of implementing organizations like CRS and Practical Action, and also university researchers, including Columbia IRI and Clark University Hurdle. CISRI forms one half of a joint consortium known as the Learning Agenda on Climate Information Services in Sub-Saharan Africa. And the other partner consortium is led, led by Windrock International. And they're focusing upstream on the CIS provider end of the value chain. On CISRI, though, we look downstream. We're focused on the user end, specifically the needs of smallholder rain-fed farmers and the factors that influence their uptake, their access, and their use of CIS. We have four work streams that are working on meeting a variety of needs, including 
synthesizing existing evidence on CIS users and their needs, conducting evaluations on CIS effectiveness, and developing processes for sharing that learning so that we can help direct future investment, research, and program design. Workstream 2 is where I'm focusing on today, and it's examining how climate information is reaching farmers, looking at where it's breaking down, and where the most promising intervention points are for improving the system. In this workstream, we're designing and piloting a participatory systems mapping approach to answer the questions that you see here. At the same time, we're developing tools and guidance so that hopefully others can also pick up and use this methodology to assess and design CIS systems within their own programs with the user perspective at its heart. So far, we've conducted two pilots in Niger, uh, one primarily with villages in the Tillaberry region, where our partner CRS is leading a BRACE project. And one, which is currently ongoing, is taking place in Zindere, where Mercy Corps has a Food for Peace project known as Salki. We're also wrapping up a pilot in the Kafrin region of Senegal, where there are multiple projects that are delivering or have delivered CIS to farmers. To give you a quick snapshot of our approach, uh, the research methodology that we've been developing and piloting is based on five steps. Uh, starting with framing the system, which is conducting background research and interviews with key stakeholders and that services, and implementing partners to determine the boundaries and the general characteristics of the CIS that we want to examine. We then draw from this inf information and the discussions to draft a preliminary CIS map that gives us an idea of how the system should work in theory, um, and then to refine our research plan and decide where we're going to dig a bit deeper. The bulk of our qualitative data collection is through a series of participatory systems mapping workshops that bring together stakeholders from the village level up to the regional or the national level to collaboratively map the system and share their perspectives, discuss communication breakdowns, constraints that they see from their angle and from their position within the chain, and to identify opportunities for locally-led solutions to improving it. Throughout the process, we integrate uh, this empowerment stage, which is supporting actors to learn more about CIS and its value, how the systems work, and the role that they and other key actors play in it. And as a pilot, we have this learning and feedback throughout the whole process to improve our approach and the tools so that we can support others to go through the same process. One of the key issues we're trying to, tra to tackle through this approach is that we're hearing that different actors along the CIS chain are not communicating with one another. So that actors on the provider end assume the information is reaching and is useful to the farmer end users, which are often thought of some homogenous group. And then there's also no real mechanism from the village level for feedback about what's working, if it reached them, and if it was useful. So our approach is to do a series of cascading workshops, starting with separate men and women farmer groups at the village level, then bringing in a next tier of actors who are close to the community and play a role in communication, like the extension workers or radio stations or local leaders, and then pulling in government representatives, members of national met services, and higher level actors to engage in the conversation. And at each stage, we use the systems map really as a convening force to visualize and discuss parts of the CIS system, the information flows, the enabling environment, and the supporting services. The culminating workshops are often the first time all these different actors have been brought together. And the joint development of the map kind of kicks off a conversation to discuss key challenges and blockages, and for those in the room to begin to see where their roles within the larger system allow them to take steps to improve it. At our culminating workshop, the participants develop a priority list of interventions and the beginnings of an action plan, prioritizing those places where they feel like the people in the room can take actions to address the problem. As a short research project, we're not implementing the findings, but we identify champions um, among local partners, governments, and individuals who have the motivation and opportunity to carry the steps forward. So what if 
we found so far. There were a number of general themes that emerged common to both men and women groups. Uh, we heard the traditional signs, the appearance of certain birds or flowering trees have lost some of their predictive power, or as one farmer told us, the indicators are misbehaving. Uh, we also heard um, that this can present an openness to other sources of information, that people are seeing things are changing, they're seeing that what they've traditionally relied on isn't as uh, predictive as it used to be, and it's an openness or a window of opportunity for introducing CIS. We also generally heard three key challenges in the information that they do access. One is the issue of timeliness, that sometimes the information re reaches farmers after a critical decision-making window has already passed, so the fields have been prepared, seeds have been bought, and they are unable to use the information that they receive. There's multiple reasons for this, um, including overstretched extension agents, the lack of radio coverage, and poor communication among different levels of government and institutions. Also, many issues related to access, that the information may not be in the local language, that farmers don't have radios or the ability to purchase them, and that the types of climate information that farmers would like to receive may not be available, which could be information on pests or dry periods. And finally, critically, the ability to use the information. Farmers are sometimes unsure of how to go from the information that they've received to translating that into what do I do on my farm. So there's really a lot of need to help with that translation and the extension workers um, to help fill those gaps. Um, information is often not sufficiently downscaled for farmers to act on, and some farmers lack input to take action, such as seeds or equipment. Our research also revealed many gender-related differences, particularly in access to climate information. And these gender and societal barriers exist on multiple levels. So you see them at that individual or household level, the community, and then in the wider system. So I'm going to share just a few of those findings. Women generally had more limited knowledge than men about CIS, and we think that this is directly related to the issues I'm about to mention about access. So women farmers were far more likely to say that they did not have access to a radio, means to purchase one, or the time to listen to it. So this was also seen as one of the major diffusers of CIS. And though some women said their husbands owned radios, this wasn't viewed as a shared resource. And if a man received information via the radio, it was not guaranteed that he was going to then share that with his wife. Many women farmers also shared that they were not invited to attend village meetings at which chiefs might share climate information or they did not have their husband's permission to go. And even for ongoing CIS programs, we learned that women were not always reached. In Senegal, some women said that field agents, usually all men, only spoke to the other men, or they preferred to communicate via phone. And by default, because women were less likely to have these, ended up that mostly it was the men farmers who were receiving this information. And any information that arrived in French or via written text presented additional barriers to women understanding as they're less likely to be literate or to speak the language. We also heard how a lack of decision making within the home influences what women can do with the information even if they receive it. In Kafreen, for instance, women base their cropping practices on decisions not made by themselves but by their husbands. It's the husband who decides what she can plant, when, and where. So even if the wife has the CIS information, She'd not be able to act on it if it is different from what her husband wants, and those are the power dynamics within their home. However, our research also pointed to the power of women groups. In parts of Kafrain, our researchers found there are strong women producers groups with strong women leaders who have been trained on CIS. And it's a totally different picture in these groups, where women feel empowered to use the information to make cropping decisions in the same way as men. This was the exception. Most women weren't in these groups but the differences where they existed and did not were pretty stark. And finally, our research also noted that women have an interest in getting additional information to make non-agricultural household decisions, such as concerning their children's safety under certain weather conditions, should they be outside or not, and the inform information on health and diseases. So when we think about plugging in CIS into these complex socio-cultural systems, 
I think it really points to the need to bundle CIS in a package of supported, supportive multi-tiered interventions that address gender-related challenges on multiple levels. A number of possible intervention points were identified in the research. Many of them focused on the potential of radios or TVs to disseminate information more effectively. But for this to be possible, they have to effectively reach men and women farmer and farmers and pay attention to the gender-related barriers in accessing technology. So a couple suggestions were made on this end. Organizing men and women listener groups that would tune into climate and weather-related radio messages together. Ensure any CIS radio messaging is diffused during hours when both men and women are available, preferably in the evening when they're not in the field and women are not preparing meals. Make CIS available in local languages and via vocal messages rather than written word. This would enable women to have better access and use of the information. Increase the number of female extension agents as a way to better ensure women are getting the support that they need. Support the development of community groups and the training of key group leaders on CIS so that they can be effective disseminator, disseminators, as was the case for the women producer groups in some areas of Kafrine. And engage the supporting services that help both men and women to act on the climate information, so agri-dealers, seed dealers, and financial services. While many of these findings point to increasing access to information and changes to the enabling environment, Underlying socio-cultural norms and behavior changes that restrict women's decision-making power will also have to be addressed to ensure women are active agents of resilience. How do these dynamics start to shift? That's a big question, but I wanted to quickly pull in some insights from a gender program Mercy Corps is working on called BRIDGE, which is building resilience through the integration of gender and empowerment. Bridge is working with six Mercy Corps programs in three countries, Indonesia, Niger, and Nepal, to pilot approaches to strengthening resilience to climatic shock through a gender-sensitive approach. Through its assessment, Bridge identified three important gender pathways which support resilient capacities that can lead to increased resilience at household and community levels. These are household decision-making, group participation, and market access. And to build these capacities, Bridge takes a three-pronged approach that includes couples dialogue on women empowerment and decision-making in the household, training religious and traditional leaders as central advocates of behavior change to defend women's rights and promote dialogue between spouses in sermons and teaching. And this was found to be a particularly powerful catalyst of behavior change across the community. And finally, learning days for participants to share what they learned with others in the community through skits and songs. Uh, these activities are paired with follow-up coaching and measurement to see if the household decision makings are increasingly more moving towards being more joint and collaborative. Bridge is pull, pulling together its final tools and findings from its pilots now. So preliminary, preliminary findings show these approaches have made progress in shifting behaviors and promoting greater equity in household decision making. And I think there's some lessons the CIS community can draw from here. We'd like to see in the next steps of our research the opportunity to pilot these findings and explore how CIS and gender programming, like Baton Bridge, can more effectively complement one, one another to ensure that women are empowered not only to access climate information, but make decisions that increase resilience in the household and their community. So as far as next steps for us, this is fairly informal, given that we're still synthesizing learnings from two pilots. And there'll be more to come in the coming months when we have our final research report, tools, and guidance. But to end with four final thoughts or takeaways, I would say the needs and preferences of women are different when it comes to CIS. And it's important to identify these differences and tailor CIS design and implementation accordingly. Improving access to climate information without addressing access to other resources and the capacity to act on that information will not be effective. We have to program for what women need to influence decisions in their households and at other levels so that can lead to more resilient outcomes. Thirdly, this of course takes time. CIS acts in the same constraining, constraining socio-cultural norms 
as other interventions. And we'll need longer time frames for research and to encourage stronger feedback loops with communities. And lastly, I think our findings from this research really points to the value of participatory action research in this space. And the participatory processes are really valuable to helping to bridge the gap between providers and useful providers and users and identifying their user needs and potential solution points. So I think I'll leave it at leave it right there for now and turn over to you. Great. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. And thank you very much to everyone who has been sharing information and resources in the chat box. We really appreciate the links that you've shared um, and helping to answer each other's questions and share some of your examples from the field. So uh, we really appreciate um, all of your engagement. So we have about 30 minutes left in our time slot for questions. And uh, we've been collecting your questions as they have come in. Please do continue to post your questions in the chat box. And we'll get through as many as we can in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Let's see. All right, so uh, looking back to some of the questions that came in a bit earlier, I'll, I'll ask a kind of a broad one from Sarah Seavey, who asked, where are women and men receiving their information? Uh, is it mostly from extension agents, and what is their level of support from extension? She asked a question more generally about info access, but we could reframe it to climate weather information more specifically. Uh, where are they getting their information from? And we thought that perhaps Kristen could answer this question. Sure, that's, uh, that's a good question. And I can speak from our research sites in Niger and Senegal. Um, we have the experience of doing this participatory mapping in some areas where projects were actively delivering CIS, and also in an area in Zendaya where the project was not currently delivering CIS. So we had a sense of what are the sources of information apart from the implementing partners. Um, so if I start there, in the case where uh, we don't have a project delivering CIS, um, people in the community told us that they received information via the radio. This was sometimes at different levels. There's community radio stations, re regional radio stations, national and even international stations, like BBC, who have local correspondents who might share information. <coughs> Now, of course, there's challenges there in terms of how downscaled and appropriate and accurate it, it is um, for the community and whether it's in the correct language. But those were, radio was certainly a big piece of it. And another critical node for climate and weather information were, were um, mayors. People viewed mayors as uh, key sources of knowledge and with access from, from a wider range of uh, sources than people at the village level. The challenge that we found here is that the mayor is often disconnected from the chain of communication from like national met services down to a village level. And so <laughs> mayors were often also relying on traditional knowledge or um, from traditional leaders who might be predicting the, um, the weather forecast and other patterns as opposed to what we might think of as other scientific uh, sources of climate information. So that was certainly a challenge. Within projects, extension agents play a really large role in communicating this information. And in some projects, they've been working with local radios to ensure better interpretation and communication of CIS. Yeah, uh, this is Elizabeth. I just wanted to jump in here. I noticed you know, this question and a lot of the questions that are coming through um, are sort of looking for specific answers. And I think it's important to kind of take a step back and just reiterate that you know, gender norms and barriers, um, and including you know, men's and women's access to different sources of information is really context specific. And it's hard to generalize across many different contexts in terms of which sources men and women are using. Um, it really changes. And in, the, in general, the barriers to adaptation um, also change. So in some communities, women may not be able to join groups. In other communities, women may be actively participating in groups already. Um, and so it's, I think that's why you know, when Kristen pointed out participatory methods in terms of the mapping, in terms of participatory action research to understand what's going on in a particular community where interventions are taking place is really critical because these kinds of things need to be identified in that place in order for them to be really effective. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Thank you. 
Uh, all right, Elizabeth, a question that came in during your presentation, and if desired, we can help you jump back to any slides you'd like to, um, to re-reference. But uh, Abby Love from Mercy Corps uh, said that in the climate change perception data graph, how did the perceptions compare to the reality of the change for the different variables? Are men's perceptions more accurately or closely aligned with the actual changes? Could you know, men or women be over-perceiving, or could men be over-perceiving and women under-perceiving? Mm -hmm. um, in some of the work that we've done, we've compared farmers' perceptions with the actual climate trends. Um, sometimes they're accurate and sometimes they're not. Um, I think the important thing to emphasize there is that people respond to things that they're perceiving and not necessarily what's really happening or what is going to happen in the future. So that's why climate information itself is very important because farmers need to know, you know, based on science, what's really going on and, and what, how things may change in the future. As Kristen pointed out, you know, a lot of the things that people are using to predict weather in the past, traditional methods, may not be reliable anymore. And so they really need to be able to have more accurate scientific data. Um, we haven't looked at the sort of trends compared to men's and women's responses differently. That, that's definitely an area of research that, that could be further explored, I think, and would be interesting to do to see if, if women maybe have more accurate perceptions than men or vice versa. It's not something that we've looked at yet, but that's definitely an interesting thought. It's interesting that perception is part of reality. Uh, yes, that are, and part of the decision-making context, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, thank you. Uh, let's see. All right, another question uh, came in from Nyasini, Nyasini who asked uh, during Elizabeth's presentation, since there is a clear difference between men and women on what technologies they adopt, how do we involve the meteorological department to develop climate information for men and women? And that could perhaps start with you, Elizabeth, but if anyone else wants to chime in on that as well. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think, again, that goes back to the idea of having participatory mapping and services, I think Kristen framed this approach very well. Um, you have to do some kind of scoping assessment to understand, okay, what are men's and women's roles in agriculture? How might they be differentially affected by the kinds of climate changes or shocks that they're experiencing based on those roles? And what are their information needs? Um, I think Tatiana pointed out um, in some places women are planting later than men because they help their men in the fields first and then they plant later. So they actually may need information about when the rains will stop so they know what kind of varieties or crops they should be planting because they then know how long you know, of a season they have. So understanding, again, what those needs are in a particular context is important and having this kind of dialogue and scoping assessments and participatory research throughout an intervention is, is really the best way to, to get at that and to be able to address those needs. I totally agree, and I, I like what you said about throughout an intervention, because I think this missing a feedback loop is really critical, um, and so we can't just have these conversations at the beginning, um, but there also needs to be some mechanism for those higher up on the provider end to hear if what's being experienced on the ground is actually accurate, if it's reaching them, if it's timely, and all those other things that we know it needs to be to actually have an impact. Great, thank you very much. Uh, just a comment also. Yes, go ahead, Tatiana. Oh, sorry, yes, I think I had muted myself earlier. Um, uh, yes, but just with regards to um, including the, the meteorological department in particular, um, we've seen that in those interventions that encourage, um, say, um, knowledge sharing um, amongst those diverse institutions that, are, that can be affecting or influencing climate services, for example, bringing the Met Agency together with the Ministry of Agriculture, in particular uh, the Department of Extension Services, can be really productive. Oftentimes, um, well, it's the Ministry of Agriculture and Extension Service in particular who are who might be more in tune than the Met Agency about uh, local farmers, about um, uh, just um, in some uh, trainings that we've had here at the IRI, uh, for example, um, where that type of bringing together of diverse actors was, was possible. Um, you kind of saw the um, really helpful knowledge exchange. Um, uh, oftentimes, perhaps, the Met Agency might be as uh, aware or, or in tune or, or working on the ground like that as with 
farmers, if that's our particular interest, no. Um, um, so that type of, the types of forums um, or, or dialogues can be really helpful also. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we had uh, questions come in about, uh, or asking for a little bit more understanding of percentages of time spent on certain activities from both Dick Tinsley and Percy Tabaj, and so I thought I would raise those. Uh, Dick Tinsley said, in a collaborative family relationship, what percent of women's time and energy are devoted to domestic needs, thus limiting the time they can spend assisting their husbands in the economic family activities? And Christy echoed, on a related question, what percentages of time and energy of men are devoted to agriculture, thus limiting their ability to contribute to household activities? And to the extent that you, you, know, you may not have data at your fingertips, but can maybe point to where people can find out more information on percentages of time spent. So I want to first point out that there's a very large continuum um, between antagonistic and cooperative. Um, and to some extent, I don't think we should assume um, that people are necessarily, that the spheres in which family members of different sexes may be operating are the same spheres. So there's, people are not always working the same plot or working with the same animals, either collaboratively or antagonistically. There's a, a large continuum of what people are doing and what those relationships look like. In terms of um, percentages of time, um, there are different household level surveys, the LSMS, um, as well as the WIA surveys that you can find online as part of the Seed the Future population-based surveys that do have broad categories of how um, women and men are spending their time that would include livelihoods, some agriculture, care and reproductive, transportation, leisure, and so on. And so those resources are out there, and we can post some links to those. There hasn't really been a whole lot of comparative analysis or in terms of, you know, what is an intervention that is necessarily going to shift, you know, a man's, you know, a man's time away from agriculture or other alternate lively into care or reproductive activities and so forth with women. So we don't really have, you know, global percentages or even national percentages of what does people, you know, what does the gender time look like and how does that relate to the information they have and who's making what decisions. I don't know if Tatiana, Elizabeth, or Kristen, you want to say anything more? Yeah, I mean, I think you pretty well covered it. The issue of, you know, how contentious are these household negotiations versus collaborative. I think Mercy Corps' um, household decision-making, you know, um, interventions that they're doing are actually really helpful at identifying areas where there are, you know, cooperation and kind of highlighting, okay, well, what are the different priorities in the household? How do you bring all of those things out, how does everybody sort of acknowledge what people's needs are and then move forward in terms of prioritization. And so I think that those kinds of tools can be really helpful at helping point out areas, well, if we all agree that this is really important, let's, let's prioritize that. But having those kinds of dialogues and facilitated dialogues in communities where maybe they're not taking place as much can be helpful. And I believe my colleague Audrey Anderson might be on, on the line as well. Um, perhaps she can linked to some of the bridge resources and such. Um, but I know that one of the important things that bridge has come out with is in this, in thinking about decision making within the household, there's also a spectrum of, of um, from complete lack of collaboration around decisions up to like really making a joint de decision together. And so on different decisions and in different households, you can really be on a different place along that spectrum. So it's not just black or white. Um, and Audrey's saying, uh, stay tuned. Some of those tools are being finalized and we'll be sharing in the coming weeks. So thank you, Audrey. And I'd also say that currently, unless you are able to do this, um, you know, in project evaluation, you know, efforts and data and surveys, the way that these questions are typically asked in large household surveys, we're not able to necessarily break down what agricultural activities are, you know, what agricultural activities women and men are 
doing in terms of how they're spending their time. And often when we're asking about decision making, we're asking about decision making at large in agricultural production. I know the WIA tends to be along those lines. So you wouldn't necessarily be able to say who is making the decision to adopt this particular seed or about when to plant. You wouldn't be able to get that information from you know, the current set of national level surveys that are out there. So that's something that really does require more in-depth and context-specific information to understand, you know, which are, you know, what are currently women's and men's decision points, and how is that influencing where their time is going. Great. Thank you all very much for that very interesting discussion. Uh, before we move on with questions, I just wanted to call everyone's attention to a few upcoming attractions on AgriLinks. Um, and first up, we actually have, we're bringing back our Ask Ag online chats that we haven't held in a while, but they are um, one hour lunchtime uh, abilities to have a direct chat with some experts um, uh, on the AgriLinks website. So there's a link at the top for to tune in tomorrow to our chat on facilitating and financing agricultural technologies. Also, uh, this webinar is, in a sense, a kickoff to our um, May theme month on AgriLinks, which will be on climate, weather, and resilient agriculture. And you, anyone on this webinar, you are welcome to contribute uh, resources, blog posts, events, and the like uh, to AgriLinks on this topic. You can either do it directly when you're signed into your account, or you can always email uh, me or agrilinks at agrilinks.org. I'll put those emails in the chat box if you have something you'd like to uh, contribute and stay on our newsletter to make sure you receive all of that information. And then we also have a couple of upcoming AgriLinks events in May. Uh, we are going to be sharing some learning from an impact evaluation on water users associations in Tajikistan that was uh, conducted by Feed the Future. That's going to be really exciting. And um, also a webinar on index insurance with UC Davis's Innovation Lab for assets and market access. So, be on the lookout for those uh, announcements in the future. All right, let's see. We have had a few more questions come in, and we've still got about 15 minutes to get through any uh, further questions. So I thought there was an interesting one from Virginie Le Masson from ODI, who asked, have you looked at the gender parity and dynamics of CS intermediaries, such as NGOs or national meteorological organizations, and does increasing awareness on gender issues at that level facilitate more efficient communication and the use of climate information by farmers? Yeah, I mean, maybe if we've done some work on looking at these kinds of um, organizational issues um, in terms of capac gender capacity, um, what we found is that a lot of organizations working on climate change issues report having some limited capacity to integrate gender into what they're doing. Um, and I think especially in terms of government agencies and NARS. Uh, so there's definitely, I think, potential to improve the capacity of organizations delivering climate services, NGOs and other groups that are working in the communities on climate change issues to better integrate gender, and there are lots of tools available um, to help support that process. Um, I think maybe a lot of times it can be overwhelming for an organization when there are so many tools out there. Um, it really takes a sort of longer capacity building effort to get the kind of staffing and um, you know procedures and processes in place at the institutional level to be able to really um, deliver on these kinds of gender you know, transformative um, programs. Uh, so that's definitely an issue and an area where I think there could be room for improvement, not just in the community level. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we also had a question that I think Tatiana wanted to take a first crack at from uh, Niran Jaka who asked what were the most innovative ways the team, the team observed to increase women's access to climate information? Uh, yes, um, um, thanks for this question. Um, from what we've been learning, oftentimes what comes up is the inclusion of diverse communication channels can be particularly helpful in an intervention. 
uh, in particular, um, and also kind of referring back to some things said previously throughout the webinar about the, how helpful par participatory methodologies can be. Um, we've seen in a previous project where participatory methodologies were used to learn about women's and men's uh, preferences for communication channels and uh, certain uh, challenges they might be experiencing to access certain uh, points of information, points of dissemination of information, um, such that uh, through that project, um, it was set up to start disseminating uh, information that would be helpful for women through um, well, at the water holes. Um, and, um, and also kind of referring back to another um, uh, recommendation that had been made earlier as well, this type of participatory methodology was implemented um, throughout the course of the project. So as the intervention was being developed and, uh, and, and you know, these uh, new and different communication channels or dissemination points were being used, um, the, this kind of participatory evaluation process um, continued to be making sure, you know, if, if how helpful the, uh, the, the new dissemination channels were going. Um, and uh, and so, so that's something that, that you see um, in interventions where you've seen some um, kind of helpful outcomes uh, for both men and women that um, the intervention uh, perhaps included the conventional communication channels, but also had incorporated to a certain extent some uh, uh, methodologies to understand better both men's and women's um, information needs, and then you know included um, some more diverse communication channels beyond what's usually used, and um, and that was really helpful. So that's just kind of a general response right there to that question. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Um, please do keep putting in some of your questions as we have a few more minutes to answer them. In the meantime, we hold up our ending poll questions, which we always ask everyone to answer to help us improve and shape uh, future programming. So do let us know what topics you would like to see in upcoming seminars, whether you can apply what you learned to your work, uh, what your key takeaways are that struck you from the webinar today. Um, and of course, we're very grateful for your feedback. Any ways we could have improved the webinar or improve on the webinar series going forward. Don't hold back. We're happy to receive any constructive criticism. And, and yes, we've posted that this is our last call for questions. So um, we will see if any more have come in. And we're, we're very grateful for all of the resource sharing uh, in the chat box. It's been, been excellent. Let's see, I'm combing through our questions here. Um, and then, I've, well, I've, perhaps I'll call out that um, Martin Kelly says that they highly appreciate tools that integrate gender into climate resilience and are looking for ways on how to help women farmers adapt to droughts and flooding. So he's on the lookout for resources. Um, so to the extent that anyone has useful resources, please do post them in the chat box. And if our presenters have any key resources you want to highlight, um, that's always appreciated. Elizabeth? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll just point out that we're working on sort of operationalizing, I guess, this um, GCAN framework, the Gender, Climate Change, and Nutrition Framework. Um, basically, because you know, these gender issues are so context-specific, the tools are, cannot be sort of um, <laughs> tailored to any sort of one-size-fits-all solutions. But basically, what we're developing is a sort of a set of questions, a checklist, if you will, for each of the elements of the framework um, what are the things that you need to consider in your context or in the context of your intervention um, in terms of men's and women's absorptive and adaptive capacity, preferences for different um, responses to climate change and shocks, what is the sort of decision-making context, and what might be some of the outcomes of different um, you know, responses that are adopted um, for men and women and how the, there might be differences there. So, um, we're sort of refining that at the moment. We have a session at a uh, Cracking the Nut uh, conference in Guatemala later this summer where we'll be sort of walking um, through those steps. And we're also working with uh, Mercy Corps' bridge program to help 
refine these tools and bring in some of the thinking from our GCAN framework. So we're working together on that, and those tools are also uh, forthcoming, as Audrey mentioned, in the chat box. So there's definitely a lot of tools out there. I think what's difficult is that people often look for the solutions or the answer to improve women's status you mm -hmm. know, through an intervention. And we, uh, we can't really provide those answers, but we can provide the tools to help you get the answers that you need. Excellent, thank you. Um, all right, well, I can see that our, our questions, we've been able to address most of them, and um, we've, we've had a really good discussion, one of our strongest discussions in the chat box. So we really appreciate all of your participation. Um, so uh, knowing that we all have uh, lots of gender-related work to get back to, I think I will go ahead and uh, close the webinar. So I'd like to extend a very sincere thank you to our presenters for your excellent discussion, excellent presentations, uh, to our participants for your engagement in the chat box, and to the uh, Feed the Future Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project for your wonderful, consistent support of the AgriLinks webinar series. So thank you all for participating. We'll see you at future AgriLinks event and events, and be on the lookout for the post-event resources in your inbox. Thank you very much, and bye.